Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. You are worshiping today. I was blessed. Blessed by your faith. And, you know, if you can worship God through difficult seasons, you can worship God in all seasons. Amen. And, uh, hey, I've been going through a good season, but I have my times. And I want to talk about that actually today. I titled my message, Divine Opportunities in Difficult Places. We're going to be in the book of Acts. I need to cover three chapters. I'm only going to summarize one of them, though. Um, I'm going to do a lot of reading. You don't have to. Good news. Maybe you're still waking up. You're not ready to read a lot. I'll do the reading. You just follow along in scripture, okay? And you can follow along on the screens as well. The reason why I need to cover three chapters is because they're so connected, you can't really break it up. All right? And Paul's destination is Rome. He's on his way there. But first, God wants to complete some things in his will for Paul's life. And you ready for this? He has called Paul to preach the gospel to political leaders around him. He is going to be in front of Governor Felix, Governor Festus, and King Agrippa before he goes to Rome. And Paul told his apprentice, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, he says this, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Amen? Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity in hopes that our, this is why, in hopes that our testimony would lead people to the Lord. Verse three, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved. Say everyone. Everyone. To be saved. That's what he wants. And to understand the truth. And who better at this time in this situation to represent Jesus outside of Jesus himself Okay, because Jesus called apostles and he called us to represent him no matter where we go. All right, who better than the apostle Paul who was changed by Jesus on the road to Damascus, amen? So God is, God's will is for Paul to be before these leaders, to influence them, to share the gospel before he goes on to Rome. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I have where let me ask you this question, just rhetorical question, but you can say amen if you, if you have. Have you ever found yourself right in the middle of God's will? Like not just, not just okay, I, I belong with this, this person, you know, I'm married to this person or I'm supposed to be in Delaware working at this job, but even like those little things that God asked you to do on the side in your journey, like being there for someone in need and you could tell I was meant to be here today. It just seems like Paul was meant to be here in this situation. And I have experienced that. And it's such a blessing to follow Jesus and realize, wow, I'm in the will of God right now. And it's the safest place to be, by the way. It's the most peaceful place to be. It's the most reassuring place to be. What I thought sometimes in my life was a distraction, maybe an interruption, a trial or a detour, in the end it wasn't. It was a divine opportunity. Do not count out distractions. Do not count out interruptions or trials. God uses them for our good and his glory. So keep your eyes open. That's what we're going to talk about today. Again, I have a lot of reading to do. I'll go quickly. I'll stop a few places here and there to help explain some things and to focus on some things. And uh, I think we're going to enjoy this dramatic encounter between Paul and these leaders. Uh, Acts 24, verse 1, he's been in Caesarea for quite some time, and he's waiting for this hearing, and here we have it. Five days later, Ananias, the high priest, arrived with some of the Jewish elders and the lawyer Tertullus to present their case against Paul to the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented the charges against Paul in the following address to the governor. Just so you know, the actual witnesses didn't come, a lawyer came. The ones who accused Paul didn't even show up, a lawyer came instead. 
You have provided a long, listen to this guy. He talks this guy up, okay? He talks Felix up. You have provided a long period of peace for us Jews and with foresight have enacted reforms for us. For all of this, your excellency, we are very grateful to you. But I don't want to bore you, so please give me your attention for only a moment. We have found this man, Paul, to be a troublemaker who is constantly stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the cult known as the Nazarenes. This guy's just making stuff up. Furthermore, he was trying to desecrate the temple when he arrested him. Not true. You can find out the truth of your accusations by examining him yourself. That was a mistake. Because Paul is a great defender of himself. Then the other Jews chimed in, declaring that everything Turtle has said was true. The governor then motioned for Paul to speak. Paul said, I know, sir, that you have been a judge of Jewish affairs for many years, so I got, gladly present my defense before you. You can quickly discover that I arrived in Jerusalem no more than 12 days ago to worship at the temple. My accusers never found me arguing with anyone in the temple, nor stirring up a riot in any synagogue or on the streets of the city. These men cannot prove the things they accuse me of doing. But I admit that, the, that I follow the way, which is those who believe in Jesus, which they call a cult. I worship the God of our ancestors and I firmly believe the Jewish law and everything written in the prophets. I have the same hope in God that these men have, that he will raise both the righteous and the unrighteous. Because of this, I will always try to maintain a clear conscience before God and all people. Just so you know, in the end, every person will be resurrected. Those who have died before Jesus' return, everyone will be resurrected and then they'll be judged. But those who believe in Jesus Christ will receive eternal life. <clears throat> those who do not receive, receive or believe in Jesus Christ will not have eternal life. So we, we are seeing Paul bring that up here where he's letting people know that all people will be resurrected. And Paul talks about the resurrection throughout the next, this chapter and the next two. What he's trying to do is, is preach and teach the gospel. Verse 17 says, after several years away, I returned to Jerusalem with money. So he's talking about right now. I returned to Jerusalem with money to aid my people and to offer sacrifices to God. My accusers saw me in the temple as I was completing a purification ceremony. There was no crowd around me and no rioting. But some Jews from the province of Asia were there, and they ought to be here to bring charges if they have anything against me. He's a good lawyer, isn't he? Ask these men here what crime the Jewish high council found me guilty of, except for the one time I shouted, I am on trial before you today because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Well, that doesn't sound like a matter that would, you know, put someone in prison and be killed or executed. At that point, Felix, who was quite familiar with the way, adjourned the hearing and said, wait until Lysias, the garrison commander, arrives, then I will decide the case. He ordered an officer to keep Paul in custody, but to give him some freedom and allow his friends to visit him and take care of his needs. That, that was nice. A few days later, Felix came back with his wife, Jerusalem, who was, who was Jewish. Now, let me just stop for a moment to give you some context. Felix actually had a struggle with lust and women. And Felix was actually considered a, a tyrannical le uh, ruler and leader. He was not that great of living under. And he actually enticed Jerusalem to leave her husband to be with him. So he was, he was wrong in his actions. It was sinful. So going on in verse 24, it says, sending for Paul, they listened as he told them about faith in Christ, Jesus. So Felix and Jerusalem want him to come and Paul takes that opportunity to preach about Jesus. As he reasoned with them about righteousness, we know righteousness is, right? Right living, holy living. And self-control, they didn't have that. And the coming day of judgment, Felix became frightened. Go away for, uh, go away for now, he replied. When it is more convenient, I'll call for you again. He also hoped that Paul would bribe him. So he sent for him quite often and talked with him. After two years went by in this way, two years, church, two years, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, 
And because Felix wanted to gain favor with the Jewish people, he left Paul in prison, even though he's innocent. I want to just apply this moment here where Paul preaches to them. Paul turns from lawyer to preacher. How powerful is that? To put aside your concern and your struggle, you know, the accusations against you to care about two people. And I believe Paul did it in love. He didn't do it in condemnation. He probably preached about faith in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ came to set us free from sin, to give us forgiveness of sin if we believe in him. No matter what you've done in your past, Felix in Jerusalem, Jesus will change your life. He, will, he loves you. He forgives you. If you give your life to him, you will have everlasting life. I'm sure he said all that. I'm sure he preached about righteousness. And so they knew what they did was wrong to the point that he, uh, Felix was even frightened and wanted Paul to stop. And that, that tells us that Felix still has a conscience, doesn't it? The problem is, deep down, Felix just wanted a bribe. He smothered that conviction. He covered that conviction that he felt in that moment, which the Holy Spirit will do to us. And I just want to encourage you with this, that if the Holy Spirit uh, convicts us, if the word of God convicts us, don't run away from it. Let it do its work. Let him do his work on you. God will speak the truth in our lives to reveal things that need to change, um, to help us to get away from a path that's gonna be a path of destruction. It's better that we don't turn our ears away from God, but we keep our ears tuned to God, amen? And I just wanna encourage you to know that if God is convicting you of something, it's because he loves you. And he doesn't want you to continue down that path. And if a brother or sister in Christ has justly and rightly called you out for something that's wrong, Before you get prideful and uh, defensive, consider that the Lord could be using that person to help you stay on the straight and narrow too, just like God was using Paul, amen? Just wanna encourage you with that. In the days that we're living in right now, we don't wanna be living how our flesh and our sinful nature wants to live. We wanna be living righteously. Because just, and and having self-control as Paul was teaching, because he said judgment is coming. And so we want to be right before the Lord returns, amen? Amen. So here's what happens in chapter 25. After two years, the governor Festus succeeds Felix and he inherits Paul's case. There's a plan to ambush Paul. Uh, They want, they want, um, Festus to send Paul back to Jerusalem to ambush him and kill him. Festus uh, refuses, insisting that Paul will be tried in Caesarea. And when Paul is brought before Festus, he defends himself, asserting that he has committed no crime against the Jewish law or the Roman authorities. And after hearing both sides, Festus should have declared Paul innocent unconditionally right there in that moment. He should have. But instead, he wanted to appeal to the Jews. He wanted to get their favor. So he entertained the idea of sending him back to Jerusalem. And he asked Paul, will you go back to Jerusalem? And Paul was like, no way. And I'm paraphrasing, no. And Paul knew the dangers of that. But Paul appealed to Caesar, which means he must go to Rome. By the way, where did God say he's going to go in previous chapters? Rome. So you can see God working out his will and plan. And so Festus agrees and doesn't make Paul go back to Jerusalem and he stays here. Here's the problem though. He doesn't really have any justification to send him to Caesar because he's innocent. And what he did was instead of declaring him innocent, he wanted to get the favor of the Jews. That didn't work out. Now he doesn't know what to tell Caesar. Caesar's gonna open up the the scroll and be like, why is he here? He's innocent. So a man comes into the scene here. His name is King Agrippa II. He's the son of King Agrippa I or Herod Agrippa I. We know who he is. He was the one that beheaded James in Acts chapter 12. He's also the one that imprisoned Peter in Acts chapter 12, but Peter was rescued by God. So 
Uh, Herod Agrippa the first son is now on the scene and Festus is telling him this case. And it has intrigued Herod Agrippa the second to hear Paul's testimony. And so that's what brings us to Acts 26. I did pretty good there summarizing that, right? All right, cool. <clears throat> that saved me a lot of reading. Okay. I do encourage you to read all three chapters together. It's pretty powerful. And if you're a lawyer, you'll love it, you know? So, all right, chapter 26, verse one. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you may speak in your defense. So Paul, gesturing with his hand, most likely just to kind of quiet them down, started his defense. I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you are the one here in my defense today against all these accusations made by the Jewish leaders. For I know you are an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. By the way, King Agrippa II was a Jew and he was very familiar with everything that was going on. Now, please listen to me patiently. Okay, so Paul is going to say he was just like his accusers. He's gonna share how the gospel changed his life. He's gonna share some things that Jesus said to him that's not in the gospels because Jesus revealed it to Paul on the road to Damascus. It's pretty awesome in the red lettering. My Bible has red lettering, which means Jesus said additional things to him that he never told the other, the other disciples, okay, the apostles. He's gonna defend himself and then he's gonna seize the moment. He's seizing the moment to evangelize these leaders. All right, so let's, let's go. Here we go. Let me get some water real quick. All right, we're ready to go. Verse four, as the Jewish leaders are well aware, I was given a thorough Jewish training from my earliest childhood among my own people and in Jerusalem. If they would admit it, they know that I have been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of our religion. Now I am on trial because of my hope in the fulfillment of God's promise made to our ancestors. He's talking about Jesus and the Messiah. In fact, that is why the 12 tribes of Israel zealously worship God night and day, and they share the same hope I have. Yet your majesty, they accuse me for having this hope. Why does it seem incredible to any of you that God can raise the dead? Again, this is why he's on trial, because he believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all people. Verse nine, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priest, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison. I, and I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. That's Paul. He used to be on the wrong side. Aren't you glad that God has saved you and you're not on the wrong side? Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus, to blaspheme Jesus, to deny Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. One day I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priest. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. Do you remember your journey? Do you remember when Christ came in on the scene? It was the light of God. It was the light of Christ. We all fell down and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. In other translations, it says, why are you kicking against the goads? It's a picture of the oxen being prodded by a sharp metal pole and they would kick against it and they would... Um, Owners would prod the cattle to go in a certain direction and they weren't gonna win. They were, they were gonna lose against the owners. And God's saying, don't kick against me. I'm, you are persecuting me and my will will be done. So surrender is pretty much what Paul was hearing, surrender. And verse 15 says, who are you, Lord, I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. See, just so you know, if we persecute Jesus, or if we persecute the body of Christ, you're persecuting Jesus. Now, that's because we belong to the body of Christ and Jesus is the head. That's the picture in scripture. So I wanna share something I just need to say. I feel like I need to say it today. If we persecute each other in the body of Christ, we are now persecuting Jesus. 
If we're hurting each other in the body of Christ, Jesus will be, in a sense, offended as well, right? Even though he's got big shoulders and he's very gracious and patient, that we can offend. And that's why there will be a judgment day for all those who have not believed in Christ. So he's saying, you're persecuting me now. You're persecuting me. And that changes Paul's perspective. Verse 16 says, now get to your feet for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future. And I will rescue you. Listen to this reassurance from Jesus. I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles. That's us. If you're not a full-blooded Jew, we are, we are the Gentiles. So Paul was sent to, to reach people like us living in distant lands outside of Jerusalem. I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Just so you know, everyone who, has, who does not have Jesus Christ, the power of Satan is holding on to them. We may not realize that until we read this scripture. This is Jesus saying this. And if we shine the light and if we shine the gospel and if we tell people about the gospel and they believe in Jesus Christ, the devil can't hold on to them anymore because they belong to Jesus Christ. When you're a child of God, the devil has no grip on you. And that's what we want. And so I'm grateful for my salvation. I asked you, aren't you grateful that Jesus met you on some road and his light shined in your life and you believe? Amen. Amen. But listen, church, when we go out into this society, I want you to keep this, this idea, this thinking in your head. Not everyone has been set free from the grip of Satan yet. Let it move us to action. Let, let us have a compassionate heart and move us to action to help those around us. At least shine the light of Jesus Christ. At least do something the Lord has called you to do, like love and show kindness. If you can't preach the gospel yet, or if you can't, if you don't know the gospel enough, at least show the love of Jesus Christ to those around you. All right? But we're hearing what the gospel is right here as well. In bite-sized pieces, he goes on to say this. Uh, verse, I'm going I'm to read verse 18 again. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. And so King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all Judea and also to the Gentiles. And here's the gospel too, that you must repent of your sins and turn to God. And prove they have, cha- uh, they have changed. He's saying they should prove they have changed by doing good things, by the good things they do. That is the outcome of someone who is truly changed. They will now live more like Christ, amen? The righteousness of Christ comes into you when you believe. The Holy Spirit comes into you when you believe, helping you and enabling you to do what is righteous and holy but we still must cooperate and also live a holy life. We must apply ourselves to Jesus, not just as savior, but as Lord, which means we listen to our leader, our Lord, Jesus, and we do what he says. That's what Paul's saying. It's not just by faith. Okay, well, yes, just by faith, by faith and grace alone, we are saved, but it's the actions that prove that we have believed. Amen? Faith without works is dead. Okay, good. You've been reading your word. Praise God. All right. Some Jews arrested me in the temple, verse 21, for preaching this, and they tried to kill me. But God has protected me right up to this present time. See, he knows that he's in the will of God, so I can testify to everyone from the least to the greatest. See, not just the least, but the greatest, the greatest, and the least. God shows no favoritism. He wants all people to be saved. I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer 
and be the first to rise from the dead. He's talking about Jesus. And in this way, announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. Praise God. Suddenly, Festus shouted, Paul, you are insane. Too much study has made you crazy. And, and you know what? There's, <laughs> Paul's not crazy, but ha, there are some people, man, when, they, when they've read a lot of books, they, they can kind of, they have a hard time landing anywhere on certain things. You know what I'm saying? Like their knowledge, they, they've read so many things, they don't know what to think anymore. They can philosophize everything and don't want to end on anything. You know, and so I know kind of what he's saying here, but, but Paul is not crazy at all, okay? And just so you know, I've, read, I've, I've hung out with some brilliant minds. Some people are so smart and they have read so many views about life and our meaning and purpose here that they struggle to believe anything. Verse 25, but Paul replied, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is the sober truth. And King Agrippa knows about these things. I speak boldly for I am sure these events are all familiar to him for they were not done in a corner. The church was born out in the open. Yes, it was in the upper room as they were praying or wherever they were. But then the gospel quickly went outside the walls of that building and spread. And the apostles went everywhere preaching the gospel. It was not done in secret. It was not in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Agrippa interrupted him. Do you think you could persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Oh, man. Paul was caught. That's powerful. Paul's preaching here. He once again transitioned from defending himself to caring about King Agrippa's soul. Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God. Now, this is one of the most powerful verses you will read in the book of Acts. Whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. Wow. You know who was in a better position than all those people? Paul, even though he had chains because he knew Jesus Christ. Then the king, the governor, Bernice, and all the others stood and left. As they went out, they talked it over and agreed, this man hasn't done anything to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. And, to, and so to Caesar he will go in our next two chapters that we will get to in the future. I want to apply this to our lives with just three simple things. And maybe the Lord will give me some more as I help us apply it here. But number one, I want to reiterate this. Just like Paul, look for divine opportunities in difficult places. And I don't mean just physical places, but in difficult uh, times and seasons as well. Look at Paul's heart. He was unjustly held for over two years and all he could care about was their salvation. You know what was powerful about Paul? He was able to put down his own worries, to put them to the side, to settle his own anxious heart of what's gonna happen to him and plead for their lives. Oh God, help us to do the same thing. I'm not saying ignore your trials. I'm not saying ignore your difficult circumstances. All I'm saying is, is let's keep our eyes open when we're going through those difficult times that God isn't placing divine opportunities right in front of us. Your coworkers, your supervisor, your boss, your workplace, it could be a difficult place, but God has a purpose for wherever you are. There's divine opportunities right there in the middle of that. I, I got a report last week or a couple weeks ago from a brother here at the church and their CEO had health, a major health issue. I believe it was a stroke or a heart attack. Do you know what the, the staff did? 300 employees came together to pray. How awesome is that? Yes, praise God.
This CEO was in a difficult place. Huh? Music? What? <laughs> this CEO was in a difficult place. I just have to have fun with that, sorry. And yet, some Christians rose up in that workplace. And they said, you know what? We're going to create a divine opportunity. We see a divine opportunity in this difficult time. And that's going to shine a light that's going to reverb into even more things. It's going to ripple effect into more opportunities. Amen? Look, I know you could be having a difficult time at work, but what if your endurance and the way you handle your endurance there, the way you handle the struggle at your workplace and you handle it with grace speaks volumes to everyone watching you. It does. It does. Trust that the Lord can work through those things. What about your home? What about your spouse or your children? Maybe things are difficult at times. Maybe you're physically and emotionally exhausted after a long week of work. Maybe you're, you're taking care of your children every day, all week, and yes, you can get exhausted. But what if in the middle of all that, moms, dads, couples, what if in the middle of all that, there are divine opportunities to speak Jesus to your family members? There's divine opportunities to speak to your neighbors right outside your house, to encourage, to strengthen those around you. Keep your eyes open for those opportunities, amen? Secondly, be a witness for Christ in all circumstances, very close related to that. When Jesus told the church in Acts 1-8, he said, you will be my witnesses. This is all the way in Acts 1-8. You will be my witnesses. He didn't specify the circumstances except for what he said in the gospels. He warned them that trials were ahead. He warned them that they would be hated because they hated, they hate God first. He warned them of those things. He never specified what they would face, but they would face peaceful circumstances. And sometimes like Cornelius' household, he came to the Lord. It was like a silver platter for Paul. No difficulty at all. All right. But there's also been hostile circumstances. And Christ has, all, has called us to be a witness in all circumstances. Would you agree? And so I just want to encourage you again, before we almost get done with this book, because we're almost done, but this has come up again and again. It matters how you endure these circumstances. People are watching. And your endurance and your strength and your grace is a testimony to those who are watching. Lastly, I have seen in this story and I have seen in my own life, the reassuring peace of God's presence will eclipse your difficult circumstance. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that the difficult place, circumstance or trial goes away, but Jesus comes in and helps you handle it. Though these difficult times were not escape, Paul could not escape this, but in the middle of it, he had peace. You won't escape every difficult season or place. Your coworkers won't escape all those different things. But Jesus can come in if we invite him in to the situation. If we invite Jesus into our perspective, if we would have eyes to see the eternal opportunities that are around us, we will have peace that God is with us. Jesus promised this to his disciples. And surely I will be with you into the very end of the age. He promised that. He would be with us. He will be there for us. How? How, you may ask. If he ascended to be with God and he is with God, sitting at the right hand of God on the throne, how is he with us? He said, I'll send my Holy Spirit, the counselor, the standby, the advocate, the counselor that will be right by you to counsel you through it. It is the Holy Spirit that is with you at all times. You know, when Jesus said that this counselor, this advocate, this standby, this helper would come, he's in the Greek, you know what it means? He's just like me. It was like as if Jesus was with them. We have this promise today that Jesus is going to take care of us and help us whatever we're going through. 
he also, his will, it allows us to go through things because other people are going through things too. But the difference is they don't have Jesus and we do. Do you see what he's doing? Do you see what God's up to? You know, we don't identify with people if we don't go through what they go through too. Jesus came to earth to go through what we went through so he could show us the way through. And God allows us to go through things, through things so that we know how to go through them with him so that everyone around us can see Jesus, not us. So that people can see Jesus through our testimony in our lives. Amen. Let's give God glory and praise for that. What a beautiful revelation. Wow, what a revelation. That was not in my notes. There's some urgency today. There's some urgency today, church. What's, what we see going on in our world? Hey, look, we're gonna stand for truth, okay? I'll continue to speak on truth. Hey, sometimes when I preach, it will get a little heavy here. You know why? People are going through some heavy things. The weight of this world seems heavy, but there's nothing greater than the peace of God. Amen. All right? Amen. And I need to say this too. It could get heavy in here sometimes when we have to expose things or when we have to be strategic and, and reveal things that we will have to go out and face. I wish I could come up here and tell you all just, you know, beautiful fields of flowers and butterflies fly up when you run into them. <laughs> but that's not the reality in our lives or the reality of our society. So there will be times where I teach on things that are gonna, are gonna burden our hearts, but we are soldiers for Christ. And we go out in love and help pull people away from the enemy. We help lead people out of darkness and into the light. And, and, and hear me out. We, we can't pull people, we can't pull people or lead people out of darkness if we can't admit it's there. You know what the devil wants us to do? He wants us to look at people and think they're all good. Put a veil over our eyes, everything's good in people's life. That boss, that coworker, he's smiling every day, but you don't know what's going on, on the inside. Look, people who have everything, they don't, if they don't have Jesus, they, they're in trouble. The, the devil wants you to be convinced that everything's A-okay. So yeah, sometimes I'm gonna talk about dark things so that we can go out and rescue people with the power of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ out of that darkness and into the light, amen? There's an urgency, not just because of what we see in the Middle East and the implications of end times teaching in the Bible about the nations surrounding Israel, which is in scripture. Jesus himself said it in Luke 21, or Luke 20 and 21. It's there, okay? It's not just that, it's in our nation. There's a, an urgency for people to be ready for, with, for Jesus Christ's return. And so I just, I pray that we can get a burden today for those who do not have Jesus. And I know I didn't teach you the how to break down the gospel, but can I reiterate this, that Jesus changed Paul's life and he used his testimony and he used the fact that Jesus was the Messiah who came to save people from their sins. And that if we put our faith in him, we become a child of God. The gospel has been in the entire book of Acts over and over again, that mankind has sinned. Nothing was gonna save us except Jesus Christ. And all who put their faith in Jesus Christ are forgiven of their sins and have everlasting life. And your life has been changed by Jesus. My life has been changed by Jesus. Amen. And the, and the reason why Paul was willing to endure all this stuff it was, is because this was the truth and it was never gonna change his mind. No matter the circumstance, no matter the persecution, no matter what they offered him, 
it wasn't gonna change. He was willing to die for Jesus Christ because he truly experienced Jesus Christ. For me, it would be like taking oxygen out of the room. I can't deny Jesus Christ. It'd be like taking blood out of my body. I can't deny Jesus Christ. You feel the same way, don't you? Amen. Well, together, let's stand if you can and let's pray for us, for our community, for our world. Would you show the love, show the light of Christ this week? I got to talk to two sisters in Christ in the lobby who've been inviting people to church. People are saying, yes, you would be surprised how many people would want to come, wants to come to church if you would invite them. I want to encourage you to be a light, to invite, to build relationship, to care for people around you. Show them how you handle difficult circumstances with the strength and peace of Jesus, amen? If you need Jesus today, if he's been convicting you of sin, but also convicting you that Jesus is right, and that Jesus is righteous and holy and he truly does love you, he truly forgives you. If the Holy Spirit has been convincing you of this, that means you, by faith in Christ, would be saved today. If you believe and receive what he's already doing in your heart. And so if, you, if that's you, the Bible says to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you will be saved. This means that we have to acknowledge that we're a sinner Believe that we are a sinner, but believe that Jesus Christ has done everything to save us from sin. And then we confess that with our mouths. So if that's you today, would you do that while I pray? And if you need further prayer or help with that decision, we're here. If you make that decision, there's also cards in the pew. Um, you can do that online as well to tell us that you've made that decision. This past week, we prayed with three people on the phone here at Calvary that gave their life to Jesus Christ. How awesome is that? Amen. We would love to see you give your life to Christ too. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when one person repents of sin and believes in Jesus Christ. Amen. So do that today as I pray. Church, let's pray for those who are committing their life to Christ, who are receiving this, and let's pray for our world. Lord, we come to you. We thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for the truth. Lord, you've called out the truth in our lives because you love us. And God, I pray your Holy Spirit would convict us and convince us of our need for Jesus. Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy with all the things we've done. God, you love us still, you forgive us. Lord, I pray that those who are repenting today, they're turning from their old ways of thinking, their old ways of living to follow their Lord and Savior, Jesus. God, I pray that your spirit will come in, change them from the inside out, May they be reborn by faith in Jesus Christ, reborn with the spirit. Have Zoe spirit life, as your word says. And that they would be able to live and follow you from this day forward. And may we as a church disciple them and teach them and be by their side. God, I pray for those outside of our community that need your light, that need the good news of Jesus Christ right now. I pray, God, that we would bring it and not just by what we say, but even how we live. Lord, bring this world back to you, God. May a great revival sweep this land and across the globe. And God, I pray that we would see our place in your body, your family, your kingdom, is that we are to go out in dark places and shine the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, give us eyes to see through, through the, the, what the devil's doing, the veil Help us have discernment, Lord, and to hear the whispers of your spirit and the direction of your, of your spirit telling us to go and show love or to speak about Jesus and our changed life. God, be with us as we go our separate ways. We thank you for the salvations that have taken place today, early in the service and, and, this, and this service, Lord, and we pray, God, that you would be with us as we go. God, we give you all the glory and praise for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.